I um, first met Jeff in the late 70s in Atlanta, Georgia, and we, we worked briefly together until he went off to New York and, and decided to become a significant player in, arch- in, the, in, the, in the world of architectural thought. Um, Bram Chodel worked for me in Georgia Tech in the, in the mid-80s before they, before they came together. They didn't know each other, but didn't know each other well. I've never actually understood exactly whether they know each other now or not, but we'll learn this evening. Um, I um, asked Jeff, we have be- had a kind of continual exchange over the years, asked Jeff to establish graduate design in, uh, in 92. And um, for me, it's, it's been one of the great pleasures of this, of this task, I think. What is emerging out of it is a new model for education that, that I believe has, has much more significance than I've been able to demonstrate internally. I think within it, not only are we able to deal with issues that obviously can't deal with, but I think that, that, that this kind of procedure advances the discourse in ways that schools are, are unable to do. I believe that through this and also through the work of the last 10 years, both of them have, have achieved a position that seems to be significant within the discourse. Jeff is, I think, the most prescient of of critics and Brahm, seen best perhaps in the in the NADA competition, has one of the most visceral kind of senses of a kind of promise of the, of the prescience of the promise of architecture. I know in one of the newspapers last week, one of these architectural journals talked of of what the AA had become. They called it Emperor's Clothes. I must say that that seems an appropriate title for the lecture this evening. It seems to me that these clothes are worth wearing, compared with the mindless. Uh, uh, um, affectations of much of English education. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce Jeff Kipnis. I got two mics. Uh, I've always been interested in the Emperor's New Clothes story and never quite understood why people thought it was negative. I mean, I thought the the clothes were quite well designed and consistent with the most radical forms of minimalism. The type you see in uh, contemporary English practice, I should say. Um, I'm, I hope most of you saw the lecture last night, because uh, in many ways I was delighted to see that and, and think of our lecture in terms of Alejandro and Fashid's lecture. There are many similarities. For one, a foreign architect, a foreign architectural theorist will come up, speak a short while, show some work, including some student work, and then afterwards a tough Iranian architect will come over and grandstand. And I think that happened last night. And um, the other sim- another similarity is that I too met my partner at Harvard, as did Alejandro and Fashid. In fact, when I met Baram at Harvard, <coughs> he didn't want anything to do with me. And I pursued him all over the campus shamelessly, you know, insisting that we become friends because I was, I mean, this is not an exaggeration, you know, I mean, I'd say, let's have lunch, and he'd say, no, I don't want to have lunch with you. I don't like you. <laughs> There's nothing about you I find interesting. And I, you know, and I'd say, no problem, I'll pay for it. And uh, <laughs> anyway, I, I pursued him because I thought his work was so intriguing. At the time, I was, I was working with Peter Eisman on the limits of signification, how you use extreme narratological processes in architecture to carry architecture through its signification systems uh, that were so popular with with less radical forms of postmodernism to the very limits. And I saw in Baram's work an attitude about abandoning the entire project of signification and looking again at the project of space. I I thought it was far more promising. and. uh, pursued him first as a friend and then as a, as a kind of critic and associate consultant to his work with Andrew Zago and ultimately as a partner. Um, unlike Fashid, I didn't marry my partner, although the partnership has felt in many ways like a marriage, at least in the Tennessee Williams sense of the term. So those of you that read Tennessee Williams will know what I'm talking about. We had no idea how to present our work tonight. We had, I mean, it's a partnership that's got nothing to do with two people trying to come together with a common set of ideas and then executing them. It's not how our partnership has been. Neither has it been in the same type of partnership as uh, Peter Eisenman and Jack Robertson had, which was a sort of partnership in name only, and you know, Jack would do 
Jeffersonian neo-historicism, and Peter would do whatever he was doing. Um, instead, a, deep, a deeply common goal, one that I think was stated very clearly by Alejandro and Fashid last night and that I'll reiterate today, has organized our work together and apart um, and in, in that organization, a partnership is what we mean by the partnership. So trying to figure out how to do this discussion tonight, what essentially we decided to do is to lay out our eight-year body of work in front of us on the table and separately pick through slides. Um, and then present, I'll try to present what I think our work is about quickly and you know give you an overview of it. And then Baram will do the same thing. Um, I think you'll find that uh, it's, it, there's a strong coherence, but nothing like a kind of simple collaboration. So I don't know if this will work or not, but we'll try. Last night, uh, Alejandro and Fashid talked about an approach to architecture which returns to materialization of space and a project of space and seeks to avoid or suspend the, the frantic search for architecture derived from sign systems. And in fact, I was intrigued. Can I? like this the whole life. Okay. Uh, focus this. This is an advertisement from Life, I mean, from Time Magazine. Many of you have seen it. It's a, it's a very common theme. If you buy a, com this is your ordinary brain waves without a computer. This is what happens when you buy a computer. Your brain turns into a kind of hopelessly boring collage of signs and symbols that are pastiched together to make a kind of rough figure of the Statue of Liberty. And th this advertisement is reminiscent of that ad that goes, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs, this is your brain on drugs with a side order of bacon. Um, so, in fact, like Alejandro and Fashid and other people that are working, this is the more intriguing image to us um, in the sense that it has a high level of coherence. It's not based on, um, it doesn't repeat typologies of organization, typologies of form that are customary or received in architecture has a high level of coherence, but at the same time seems capable of staging a very high level of differentiation, which is different than the incoherent, incongruent disorganization characteristic of collage. And so the body of work I want to show you in tonight uh, over eight years, which is about how long the lecture should take, um, will has been a search, our search for techniques to produce new kinds of coherence and that with high levels of ordination uh, or to, to bring high levels of ordination in a differential structure which does not depend on um, overdetermination and superposition of sign systems. And I'll just go through these quickly. Now one nice thing about the partnership <coughs> is that it allows me to take credit for a lot of work I didn't do. Some of the slides I'll show you early project Brom and his partner did but when I paid my partnership fee, I got ownership of these so I can say that these are our projects. <laughs> There's many ways to pursue fame in architecture. Um, quickly, <laughs> quickly, I just want to show you a quick project and talk about the technique. The technique in this project was described in terms of local geometry. Instead of using high levels of ordinated um, figure, I mean, figures of geometry like the grid or pattern, the pursuit in the project was to produce a new space, uh, a blank space like that, like that previous image on the left by techniques which we developed called local geometry, which would insert and co-inhabit co the space of the Civic Center in Los Angeles. And this is one of the local geometry drawings. Um, Soon after, we began to look at the relationship between near figure and weak form. These are two towers which were the, the terminal towers of an, axi an urban design axis in Los Angeles called the Olymp Olympic Towers. 
The idea in this tower was to take figuration, uh, let's say in the manner of John Haydick, and abstract it towards um, pure abstraction and, and then oppose that to taking a, a pure geometrical form and involute that towards figuration. So in addition to the, to the repertoire of, of um, local geometry, in terms of form making, the idea was to could pursue issues like the relationship between near figure in this tower, and you can see the sort of t head, body, wing abstracted to the, to the point where it loses its specific figurative reference and then bringing that into a relationship to a uh, highly involuted, weak form pro uh, project. The idea is that perhaps these would be able to engender interpretations in, in some sense like the Rorschach or at the same time produce chance affiliations with other uh, formal ensembles on the context. And so th these are, I don't have the context slide, but these two tower sets that are the two termini of an axis in Los Angeles. With, and then an array of these uh, weak form figures spread throughout the context which moves from one tower to the other. Um, the weak form idea was quite, quite important because, again, it, was, it, it had the power to make connections, but at the same time was free of the um, weight of repeating an architectural sign. This is a a competition for the Scottish National Museum. In each of these projects, there's obviously a lot more <coughs> issues that we pursued. And all I'm trying to do is identify you the trajectory towards our current work out of this series. Um, the project essentially is to continue this urban sequence so you can follow these, this centralizing axis. We wanted to put something in which did not belong particularly to the sign systems of the context, Robert Adams or, or the aggregate urbanism. But at, the, but at the same time fit into that urbanism in a direct way with difference. And so, I mean, it was a weak form strategy that essentially governed the urban mapping of that project. And so, multiple uh, affiliations between the context instead of just one, the, and if you look at the winning entry, one major ordinating system of the context is chosen is uh, re emphasized by the project and other existing orders in the context are, there, are thereby diminished. What we were hoping for was a project which would pick up and activate many of the systems without uh, particular hierarchy. I mean, in a certain sense, this, this space is as important as, the, as that major axis. This, this gesture to this church is as important, I mean, this theater, I'm sorry, is as important as the view to this stone. So, uh, and, and, in the and also the tripartite organization of three objects uh, which at the same time make um, super objects such as indicated in that group. So the, the, the strategy of waveform allowed us to make what we believe to be far more complex affiliative relationships uh, that didn't <coughs> depend on direct signification. Although, in, again, dep certainly depended on the tradition of formalism. Uh, let me stop here one second to uh, characterize our research because the, the, the end of the lecture I want to talk a little bit about single surface theory and the project that Alejandro and Fatigue showed last night is a stunning example of one of the trajectories of single surface theory. Uh, Fatigue and Alejandro presented, or Alejandro presented the work as an application of some ideas about cultural transition, uh, particularly the, the decline of Fordism uh, which he identified at a particular point um, and correlated with the breakdown uh, with the frantic search in architecture uh, characteristic of things like neo-historicism, critical regionalism, and deconstructivism. Now that, I, I'm, I'm intrigued with that approach to the project, although we take a slightly different approach to the question of how you conduct, uh, they characterize it as research, I, I say it's search, it's not really research. It's not research in the scientific sense, it's search. So you're searching for techniques. Uh, the best way I can describe this relationship is to compare fundamentalist analysis and market theory with technical analysis. And basically the idea for a fundamentalist is that they, if you, know, you want to know the price of oats, you look at all the influences affecting the price of oats, how many oats are being grown, what the weather in the oat world is, and then you make some predictions. For a, for a technicist, 
all you do is you look at the history, the recent history of the price of votes, and you assume that all the information that can be found about the price of votes occurs in the market, and then you analyze the market trends. That relationship, I think, is interesting, and I found it again in the lecture, two back-to-back -back lectures given by Rem Koolhaas and Peter Eisenman. Peter Eisenman essentially at the time was thinking about the consequences of dislocation and disjunction inherent in much of French post-structuralist thought, and his argument was something like this. For 400 years, architecture has been pursuing a metaphysics of totality. Because of recent events in cultural history and cultural theory, which, which foreground dislocation and disjunction, architecture should be doing something else. Um, and he's trying to do it. Uh, Rem Koolhaas gave us a lecture the next week, and he basically said, for 400 years, architecture has been concerned by the processional from the street to the piano nobile beginning almost identical to Peter's lecture. But then instead of saying because of cultural theory we do something else, he said, but because of the elevator, um, that, that history is no longer valid and, that, and has been overturned by developments within architecture. So for me, uh, there are two kinds of searches and researches that can be done. There's the, the fundamentalist approach, which essentially tries to apply changes in cultural thinking or there's a technicist approach which looks within architecture, the techniques of architecture, the material practices and technologies that are available, but most in particular, the design techniques, how you draw an axonometric, what types of axonometrics are available to you, sections, et cetera. And I think that's how our work is characterized. So all of these projects are pursued with an eye towards the internal design techniques uh, or a technicist approach. Anyway, that was an aside, but um, so Scottish National Museum and the weak form. Uh, at the same time, we were turning our attention to urban design projects and we were using grafting techniques. Instead of, this is the class, class Jacques Cartier competition uh, w which we were premiated in. Uh, this is Place Jacques Cartier. If you can see that degrading um, plaza in Montreal, the, pr the goal of the competition was to essentially reestablish the status of that plaza by refinishing the edges, making honorific termini, and perhaps uh, changing the, uh, uh, verifying the axis with street furniture and ornamentation. What we wanted to do was put in, <coughs> um, yet again, essentially the urban organizational equivalent to a weak form, which could pick up the issues of the axes without reestablishing what we believe to be a discredited urban type. And that, these are just small pieces of um, projects. At the same time, we did a project for the Montreal CBD, r which we ran in parallel to the Place Art Cartier, and uh, they were asking for um, an urban design which would connect the historic, set, historic center, historic district of the city to the northern part of the city to create a major public space through the center of the city. Now, if you looked at Montreal, it was, you know, a classic example of late 20th ur century urban pastiche. And what we thought was important is to find a technique which would allow us to, in, as a planning technique, not as an architectural technique, propose a method by which the architecture of Montreal could, over a series of future processes, become coherent. Um, in my view, this is one of the first single surface, um, although we weren't thinking in those terms, projects that we tried to do. We built a, essentially what amounted to an ideal model um, of mo what we believe Montreal to, would be. And then using a technique of double exposure, we double exposed the, the existing fabric of Montreal with some, some new buildings with that to, to create a zoning massing diagram um, that, would, that would produce three kinds of spaces, public spaces, uh, semi-public, semi-private spaces, which are podium to the private buildings and then private buildings. All the private buildings essentially would be obligated to that envelope of that previous model in their either in their redevelopment or in their, um, if they're torn down and, and built again. So essentially the city could pro progress to a coherent form as a form of zoning and planning policy. Uh, there's the zone and some of the zoning diagrams. 
Uh, quickly, I want to show you two of the projects that we've been working on uh, that, that raise one of the key issues, I think, in single surface theory. Single surface theory has two instances, uh, and it's a particular instance. I mean, last night you saw one of the um, key projects in the idea of a single surface as a literal surface, which bifurcates or involutes to create differential zones of space. Um, and that's been, uh, we've explored that in many projects uh, and, you know, several, I mean, several others that are working in this area of, of decoded research are looking at this. And it's a particularly interesting, I mean, in, in certain, you could look, for example, at uh, uh, Philip Glass or Stephen Reich as a kind of single surface theory of composing. There, there you could look for parallels in other systems of thinking without using it as a resource which justifies the work, one of the most interesting areas of single surface research has been in biology in which differential gradient theory has been used to explain fly wings, how fly wings differentiate, and in particular, or in animals in where, where a limb gets cut off and regenerates. How, when you cut an arm off of a salamander, does it regenerate? Essentially, it makes a differential gradient, single surface differential gradient, so that each cell, as it moves down the gradient, knows what it differentiates according to its location, spatial location on that surface. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about, and so the two projects I want to show you now are projects that we've done this year in the studio. I've been thinking a lot about single surface theory. Uh, so this idea of one surface which bifurcates and, and involutes to dip create differential spaces without signification is a very powerful and attractive idea. It has a problem for me in that it, it has strong resonances with a very old metaphysical idea in architecture, this idea of er substances. The single surface would be pre-cognitive, pre-signifying, would be in some sense establish itself as an er substance. And therefore, uh, I became quite uncomfortable with just assuming that the best way to pursue this is to is this idea of one surface which differentiates, although I, I do think it's an area of research worth developing. Um, so that's the fly wing model of the single surface, you know, one, one surface that you cut up and fold, or, or the Swiss you, you know, cut up and fold the street to make the surface ramps of um, Ram Kuhlhaus' Swiss you, or any of the a number of the other projects that fall into that genre. This project is that, and I'll show you what we've done. The other alternative model of single surface is the model of complexity. And the example that's quite interesting or quite frequently used is to consider the ultra-tight coevolutions of divergent species into a new quasi-species. And what I mean by that, and, the, and you know, everybody here has probably read their Deleuze. I never have read it. The books are too heavy. Um, <coughs> but the, uh, he talks about the uh, powerful relationship, coevolutionary relationship between the wasps and the orchids. As you know, some wasps have so evolved, have evolved such dependency on specific orchids, and some orchids have co-evolved to form such dependency on specific wasps that they essentially form a new organism. The wasp is uh, essentially the sexual organ of the orchid, and the orchid is essentially the mouth of the wasp. They, they, they're so intrinsically locked together that it makes no sense to speak of them as a separate organ, even though the techniques of, of uh, biological speciation, you can't say it's a new species. They still belong to very divergent species, but they form a profound coherence, which makes a kind of what we would call a phase space, not a literal space, but a phase space single surface. They make one organism in a space that doesn't belong to the three-dimensional uh, morphological space that you would use to characterize species. So that's an, an alternative model of single surface theory evolves out of that approach. And I want to show two projects. One is the single, the earth substance single surface or the literal surface. And the second one is this idea of the complex evolution. I'm sorry. This is a master plan for the north coast of uh, a tiny, an island, China, Hainan Island in the city of Haiku. It's going to be a tourist district. They asked us to do a master planning and then some design of specific sites. I won't go through the ba major ideas, but 
Basically, um, two factors affect the design of a tourist resort. One is that the average time a tourist is um, goes to a beach resort is uh, five to fourteen day five to fourteen days, with the median being uh, seven days. Um, the other fact is that eighty percent of the time they're at the resort, they they spend doing things other than going to the beach. So. Now, we, we use this factor combined with what we believe, what, when we visited the site to see the, the uh, two things. One is the amazing um, lust for activity that the Chinese were demonstrating. Not just shopping, but I mean, shopping does, it's, it's pointless to speak of shopping in the Western sense as describing what goes on, but commercial activity events-based production in, in China was unlike any we've ever seen. Spatial colonization, how they use spaces, has nothing to do with the spatial typology. So every place that's possible gets multi-use up to the point that it's uh, junk. Um, and so we, we wanted to take advantage of that, and at the same time we wanted to find a way to organize the the site to take in, to match the tourist use of the site, and at the same time to increase property values. To make a long story short, we we zoned five major attractors: um, theme park, sports attractor, adult entertainment, shopping, and then uh, a ferry. These attractors are these super lots are given over to at very low cost to developers. They're very large, one square kilometer lots. In return, the developer is obligated to d develop and maintain major civic amenities in that lot in coordination with his private developer functions. So, for example, the sports, I mean, the uh, theme park attractor would have to develop, and I'll show you, there's a whole series of civic gardens and civic beaches which are trying to increase the property values of these, these common developer sites. So the, the, the burden, the cost burden shifts from the city to the developer. In the return, the developer gets a very large land, a major concession, um, and, in, and, and pays this back at very low prices, pays this back by maintaining a designed amenity, uh, urban am amenity. Now the project, we've worked on quite a few of these projects, but the project that we'll see further development of tonight is this sports attractor which essentially is sports, health, and recreation attractor. <laughs> One of the five attractors uh, includes hotels, um, public, semi-public, and private spaces. Uh, and we approach this problem, in a sense, in the classic single surface sense. Now, this is, this is just a symbol for a sports attractor from on the master plan. Basically, the attractors consist of the private zone, which is the dark green, then artificial beach and artificial gardens which make connections to the central business district to the coast and increase the, the frontage, the amenity frontage for the other lots. Now the problem is to design a sports attractor using the, the classic bifurcating uh, or surface techniques that one finds in a single surface approach. I, and I won't describe all of these, but I think you can, so you take the, you take the surface, you core it, you pleat it, uh, that you begin to find that there is an analysis that was done by the persons working on this project which had to do with looking for the small scale contingencies between er public space, semi-public space, private space, and also the kinds of sports and recreational activities that we expected to occur at, in a 365 year basis and also in a 24 hour basis. Uh, when would projects turn on and, I mean, when would um, pro program turn on and turn off? When, could you, when do you expect it to need, you know, certain times of the year you would not expect to be in a certain field, for example, if it's raining too much, uh, certain sports could go on at night, indoors, outdoors. So these kinds of contingency relationships were used to map the single surface and to produce uh, fissures and, and pleats. And then that project was made, essentially turned into the single surface graph which was devolved into the systems of the site, including program surfaces, lighting surfaces, lighting effects, uh, pedestrian pathways, zoning for the buildings. Um, so this is the essentially, I'm going through this quickly, obviously, but this is the evolution from the 
uh, graph to the master plan to the site. The now the thing, these are buildings, these dark grays. The, the single surface event space does not condition the form or establish the form of the building. All it does is give a zoning for the building and the surface is an event space which goes through every, which essentially moves through the entire space of the site. It goes through the building. So a developer can put, <coughs> any, the principle, the idea is the build, developer could put any form or building they want there as long as they, as long as they acknowledge and maintain the single surface uh, requirements that move through that site and of course also maintain the various um, amenities, public and semi-public, uh, pri semi-private amenities on the site. Uh, so first, uh, a sort of single surface model which shows the event spaces in, in abstracted form and then a way of, oh, Five minutes. Uh, this is the beaches. No, where are they? So, are you and I fighting here? Or who's winning? Master plan, model. This is the art. Of, this is the system of artificial beaches with the water. Um, systems which are in the blue and uh, some of the lighting which is in the background in red. This is the artificial garden system with the, the blue showing the program surfaces, things like the golf course and various rec sports and recreational fields. Uh, this is the pro program surface that moves through the buildings, con contains the golf course uh, circulation through the site. Um, essentially the one of the event, the timed event spaces on the surface. Um, this is all of the program, all of the private program uh, foregrounded. This is one of the, this is one of the <coughs> night uh, organizations where wh what's lit up essentially is an active organization either activated by program or by lights or by policies which allow movement through that site. And uh, this is another of the nightscapes in which none of the programs are activated but the surface is activated by a series of differential lighting. Uh, quick, quickly the Yokohama competition. Um, and this competition was where I wanted to try something on the WASP and uh, Orchid model. Uh, so this is basically the, uh, we wanted to go back, to use an image of an object floating against a field for, uh, because the idea of, well, I, when Baram talks to you, this, uh, you'll see this is another trajectory in the work, but this object floating in the sectional space of a modern field has been a recurrent theme in the work, and we started with this image in the project. Uh, then we, we were thinking about the event space of the Yokohama, and, and we found this diagram, which it showed highly differentiated but coherent relationships that are possible in turbulent flow of water. You have laminar flow, turbulent flow, transitions between turbulent between uh, laminar and turbulent, which is which is complex incoherent flow. We use that diagram to essentially produce the uh, flow diagram of the terminal, which is basically smooth flow through the terminal functions, multi-dimensional flow flow through the virtual object, which is we, we design as a garden, and then interactive flow at the end of the terminal, which is the civic function. So um, th this is a key section um, because the spatial idea of the project is that essentially you, you produce a modern space in the, in the classic Nisian sense of uh, horizontally infinite delimited space but at the same time, you float in that space a garden. So all of this is sort of architecture, and all of that is a uh, garden. Now, the several members of the AAGDG worked in collaboration with uh, Peter Davison and Eric Lagerberg on this project. And one of the main issues that we had to figure out is, this, is the space of the garden is, in a sense, supposed to be highly complex, picturesque space embedded as a virtual object in the modern space of the um, 
of the pier so that you would always be in these two spaces at one time to create the, to create the complex spatial effect. Uh, so th these are the formal em elements assembly. And then you'll notice that the programmatic em elements assemble in a way which is not in one-to-one -one coherent, I mean, congruent correspondence to the formal elements. So there's incongruency in the relationship of the program to the form, essentially trying to create this, uh, this, uh, this, new, uh, this new entity effect, like the third entity which describes the relationship between the wasp and the orchid. Um, and the urban idea is quite simple. I mean, essentially, we believe that the pier belonged neither to the context of the city nor to the context of the water, but was a third condition, in part urban and in part uh, ocean, but a third issue, something else. I mean, the idea of looking at Yokohama or looking at cities to try to figure out what you should put there by putting more of what's already there always bothers me. It always seems to me that architects should look at cities and see either what's missing and that they can put there, you know, take responsibility for making a contribution, not simply repeating the fabric that's there, or, you know, in lesser, of lesser interest to repairing a problem. So, I mean, I think it's important to put something for architects, much like Alejandro was saying it's important for architects to reassert control, which I believe is, act is absolutely correct. It's also important for architects to be a little more ambitious and a little more um, forthright in saying this city is not already already okay and we'll just study it and put more of it there. This city either lacks something or could benefit from something new. Um, so these diagrams try to show the time dependency biasing of the, uh, e this is the floor space biasing di by due, due to program and then this is the event space biasing of the, pro of the relationship between the garden and the functions in the terminal over time. Uh, these are, each of these are gardens. Each of these are different kinds. There's a micro garden. I'd have to ask Peter what all the gardens are, but every kind of garden that ever existed in all of human history. And I think it turns out to be exactly 93, there's only 93 types of gardens that have ever existed in all of human history are represented <laughs> And they're collapsed, all of the gardens are collapsed into this uh, garden object so that the space, circulation space of this object is different than the circulation space of the terminal itself, the laminar flow space. Uh, and, you know, there are many, many pathways, but you also, I mean, the gardens are, are typological in the sense there's children gardens, there's media gardens, there's plant gardens, but they're also, they, they produce that sort of object-like picturesque space picture aspects which enable the garden to function as a virtual object in the section. Um, if, if we had drawn this, if we were able to have drawn this properly, th this, this is the parking, this is the terminal space and, and with laminar flow. Then we begin to move into the to the floors which hold the garden and allow you to circulate through the garden in the civic function. If it had been drawn properly, all this garden would have been drawn in color to differentiate it from, it's not architectonic. It's spatial organization to produce a virtual object. This is a section which is upside down. It's a, a very crucial, it's crucial to see this section upside down. <laughs> you can understand the project, understand the project much better and you know, it's conceptually always has been upside down. Uh, this is the side, you're, from the garden side, uh, you look w through the glass wall into the virtual object in the daytime. Um, so as to connect essentially both into one surface, garden and building and garden through the very thin glass wall reminiscent perhaps of Jean Nouvel's um, Cartier project in Paris to, to, to create this to s complex single surface organizational idea. Uh, this is the side, the garden side, the other side. And uh, that's my view of our work, so I'll turn it over to Veronica. Well, they just kind of flow 
follow your RAM. And I don't have a tie and I don't have a pocket. This thing works. What do I, this is for people who have want ties and pockets. This thing works if you want to just use it. Uh, it might, Joe, can you just use this? <laughs> okay. Sure. In violation of the sense of time. <laughs> what do I do with this oh. Like this? Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, this is all right, actually. I like this. Um, can I have uh, Jeff's first slide? <laughs> See, my partner, I guess, you know, some of you know this, uh, is a, how do you say, like a tough act to follow. So, I thought I'll use his first slide. But af after that, we can go to sort of, how shall I say, our slide. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I, I mean, he showed me the slide this afternoon, and he told me about his theories. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I didn't mean it this way. <laughs> I... No, I, I actually didn't. I'm, you know, I, I apologize to all of you because I, uh, sort of, a few hours ago, got off the plane. Um, that was also a tough act to follow, which I'll show you some of the tough act that I'm following these days. Uh, but it's just because I'm a little bit tired. But it's, it's, I didn't mean to make light of. Uh, theories. Uh, I used to be actually very serious about architectural theories, if I remember correctly. <laughs> um, nowadays, it's, it's sort of a, I mean, you know, it's been a kind of a quick transformation for me in the last couple of months. Because, let's say three months ago, we used to, you know, sit down and uh, in the studio and uh, talk about single surface theories and you know, I thought it's great ideas and get excited and have all kinds of discussions, which I, c I cannot even remember what these discussions were exactly. And it was just sort of, you know, Jeff reminded me of this because like two days ago, this question came up again, single surface theory. The difference was that somebody was telling me that we are talking about 18,000 cubic feet of, no, cubic meter of concrete as a single surface. He said, I, I'll show you this terminal that uh, we are designing uh, in Tehran. And they told me, you know, you know the roof is about 18,000 cubic meter of concrete. That's not a very light thing to, uh, how do you say, you know, keep it up. And then I, I, then I said, ah, oh, that's, that's probably what single surface was, <laughs> you know, the theory, I mean. Um, they also told me how much it weighs, but I can't remember that now. But I wanted to show you this, I mean, this slide sort of uh, intrigued me. I just found that out when Jeff was talking about because uh, I thought you, this this works, right? Uh, I I thought it was about 28 years ago that I left Iran and I came here, not to the AA, but you know, to these islands. Um, <laughs> I don't And I, I used to feel like this guy, exactly like this guy. And I think I made drawings, and I, made, I used to make paintings. That's how I got a scholarship to sort of come to, to these islands. Uh, I used to do things exactly like that, and I used to think like that. And when, when today, when Jeff showed the slide, I realized that uh, this is how I feel now. 
this is how sort of <laughs> I mean if if you if you open me up that's that, I mean you cut a section through me right and we used to love doing this cutting sections and things like that through all kinds of things uh, even through bodies uh, we got that from Vesalius that was our other partner Zago who taught us that so if you cut a section through me that's exactly what you get and in a certain way, I mean, I, I think I feel fine right now because uh, I think more or less I got to, to where I wanted. And so, you know, about 28 years I got to where I wanted, more or less. Maybe a few more years, if you cut a section and you see absolutely nothing. Uh, and that would, that would be really great. Okay, we can, we can maybe go to my slides now. Thanks for your first slide. That's, uh, you, you realize, I mean, I, I'm not sure who showed the slide the right way. So <laughs> 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 Probably Jeff's was the right way, I think. There's a strange thing kind of rummaging through old projects. And uh, I mean, I, I'm not really sure what, uh, what I can tell you about all these projects. And uh, I'm, I'm quite sure that I can't tell you much more than what uh, Jeff already told you. There isn't that much more into them. I don't know, maybe you were expecting a lot more, but you know, what you see is what you get. Um, but what I can tell you is that at least for me and few more people that I know in this business is that Architecture is an extremely difficult thing. Not a, not a difficult activity or a difficult business uh, or not really something that is difficult to do, but it's not a very difficult to do, especially nowadays if you have you know, power PC and some good software, to, you know, maybe some of you have SGIs or whatever. Uh, it's actually fairly easy, very easy to do. But, but it's a very difficult thing. And I'm not sure how all of us or all of you, how you become aware of this. The I mean, the, the work that uh, I've been doing with Jeff and at times also with a couple of other people, uh, it's been extremely interesting for me and it, there have been very interesting discussions and all kinds of events that uh, have made the whole activity quite uh, rewarding. But Maybe, maybe the way that I think about all this is a bit different than uh, how my partner thinks of it because for me it's been basically uh, a training. The work itself has been a training for me in order to become an architect. And each project has been a sort of a, uh, I'm not quite sure whether I can call it an exercise or an effort or, or something. Uh, it's sort of, 
you know, it, it's, I mean, I don't really know how to tell you. It's, I, I, the best way I can tell you is that um, the way that I, uh, the way that, you know, some of us talk, we call it sort of shop talk, uh, which, I don't know, shop talk has become maybe a kind of a strange thing to uh, experience in schools of architecture. Architecture has become a, a strange thing to experience in schools of architecture, but that's another discussion. Uh, but this shop talk about this is sort of like you feel like you're wrestling. And with each sort of event of wrestling, the idea is, or probably you become a better wrestler. And you just have to keep on doing this because if you if you put it away, then uh, it just stops. It's not like riding a bicycle or something. So you can always go back to it. Uh, there were a number of projects, like a lot of the projects that uh, Jeff showed you, and I'll run through them. Maybe we can sort of, can I change this here? It says forward, yeah, that's it? Oh yeah, good. Yeah, so uh, there are a number of projects, I mean that was the blue button, oh, the one that's not on, the one that's, all right. The, the two Montreal projects, uh, you know, like this project, I mean, the, ba the basic thing uh, for me in this project was to learn a certain idea of geometry, to actually to put that geometry into practice in the form of these towers. And that was just one thing. and then I was able to take that geometry in this project and carry on with that in the next project. And a few projects came up out of this same geometry. And it, they were basically, it's all sort of like uh, one project. It's, I mean, I, I would call it, let's say, a project of architecture. Uh, it's not that important to me whether it's a competition or it's a commission, whether it's a city planning project, um, you know, whether it's in Montreal or whatever. I mean, those, those things have certain parameters. And as a, you know, one would like to think as a sort of a responsible architect, you you take those into consideration, and they do matter. I'm not trying to say that they don't matter. But it's not the main event. The main event is that you're training yourself. You're trying to figure something out and accomplish something in each project. Each project is sort of a vehicle for your, or in this case, for for my project of architecture. And I'm, I'm trying to sort of go one step further to, to sort of, to become an architect. One step further in, in, in sort of learning how to become an architect. The Scottish project, uh, the uh, this was Samargand, it's a sort of a large cultural complex. That was another competition. Uh, and then all of these projects, and some of the ones that uh, Jeff showed, basically projects that started around uh, 1985 to 1992, which was the NARA competition. And in 
in a NARA competition, I felt that I could basically, for that uh, sort of time in my work, uh, or in our work, I should say, uh, sort of finish this, this project of architecture. And I thought that uh, with, with this project, I could uh, manage to use all those techniques which we use in the other project and bring everything together and produce it. Produce it to my sort of satisfaction. I was sort of for the first time, it, was, it, it lasted like, you know, 10 seconds, but for that 10 seconds I was satisfied that I've accomplished something. And then for, you know, a little bit longer, some other people that I appreciate immensely were also satisfied that something was accomplished. I mean, it's, it's sort of, you know, I'm not trying to make a big deal out of it, I'm just saying uh, this, what that I call the project of architecture, with this, with the NARA project, I thought it was accomplished and also ended. Like this, this, the form, the, the sort of the external form of the project was, I, mean, I, don't, I feel strange saying this, but I don't know how else to describe it, it was, was totally satisfactory to me. Uh, I'm, you know, maybe, maybe it's not much, but I mean, it, it was sort of the best thing that I thought we made. Then, uh, I'm not quite sure whether this was, uh, I mean, after NARA, whether this was one of uh, Jeff's theories or what this sort of a kind of an accident. It was not an accident. It was, sort of, it was actually a conscious decision that I thought that, uh, I mean, we thought that, One of those, uh, or maybe both of those, uh, that architects have always tried to to deal with space or to produce space. Um, I don't I don't really think that anymore, but I mean that's what I thought in '92. So, and I thought that. Architects have always gone about this indirectly. That if the idea was to produce space, but the, the way or, or the technique or whatever, the activity to do it was through form. The idea was that you make form and by these forms or by the juxtaposition of these forms or whatever, by the arrangement of these forms, as some architect would say extremely politely, uh, by the proportional arrangement of this form, you make space. So I thought, what about if we just drop form? I thought, you know, maybe we made enough form. Or at least we made a lot of form. So, so what if we just make space? What if we, we go directly towards this idea of producing space? And then these projects came out which I, I tried these uh, and Jeff tried these with some projects in Berlin And they were done, you know, they were done at uh, different schools, they were done at uh, Harvard, they were done at Ohio State, they were done at the AA, and we're still doing it at the AA. 
this was uh, Cardiff competition, which we did last year with the, the studio here, with the graduate design studio. That was during the, <coughs> the, the spring break. Sort of going, changing this too fast. Is this what that's happening? Or completely off. Is it okay now? Uh, this year we, we started uh, in the studio and also elsewhere, actually, in Iran. Uh, it looks like I'm sort of, after 28 years, I'm slowly, or maybe not so slowly, sort of finding my way back into sort of my own country. Um, this is a project for a water museum in Tehran. It's kind of a, a sketch model that was done at the graduate design studio here. And it's, it's, it's kind of, I, I'm not quite sure why that is because I, 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 we, we started with this idea of sort of trying to deal with space directly and since then uh, all of the projects with the exception of the airport they've all been s uh, sort of uh, not just to do with water but they've all been sort of immersed in water I don't know why This is, uh, I mean, this project is uh, it's being done in the studio here, and uh, it's going to be built in Iran. Not quite sure when, but it will be quite soon. And then uh, the airport. The airport, I mean, there's, there's a sort of a lot to tell you, and there's a lot to say about the airport. I can't really go into all of it now. Uh, it's a uh, new airport in Tehran. It is called uh, the Imam Khomeini Airport. In my wildest dreams, I never imagined that I would be the architect of Khomeini Airport. Um, And it's it's going to be it's a quite a going to be a quite a large airport when it's finished. It's about uh, it's going to handle something between 45 to 50 million passengers a year. Right now, uh, we've been working on the first terminal that's going to have its uh, first flight accommodated uh, about um, 21. 21, 22 months from now. And uh, we almost, we, we did a lot of studies here and we uh, took the studies and we started uh, the actual designing in Tehran. 
and it's to do with the design of the first uh, first terminal. Uh, there was a lot of studies which were uh, quite successful that were done here that was to do with the, the concept of the terminal. I'm not sure uh, how many of you are familiar with this, but uh, those of you who know the functional concept of terminals are quite important. They're very, very uh, limited buildings in terms of their program and their operation. And we did quite a few studies of few concepts. We had a sort of a little uh, competition, the studio, the graduate design here, and all the people who were uh, participating in this produced a design, and uh, then we moved forward from that. Uh, the idea which we've been working on and now has become sort of, I guess, suppose the official design, at least until when I, when I talked to them this afternoon, it was the official design. It changes, it may change every day. Uh, it's a very hard situation to deal with. There are a lot of people who are against it. There are a lot of other architects who want to somehow get the project. It, it is the most important project going on in Iran. Uh, the design that we started uh, working on in Tehran about, uh, now it's about two and a half months ago, this is sort of the the basic idea. Um, there, I mean you all know it's a sort of a simple thing. There are two main movements. Is this working? There are two main movements in uh, almost any terminal. It's the movement for arrival, which is from, let's say, air side. <laughs> oh. It's okay, I I'm, I'm already have enough gadgets. <laughs> from air side to land side, and this air side means this is where the where the planes where the planes come. Sorry, make sure. And then uh, the movement from land side to air side, which is departure. What we have here is something that has to do with uh, three sort of waves. Two of them is the movement. Two of these waves are the movements from for arrival and for departure. And then there is another one that goes across these, sort of the red zone. And that's the movement of the public. It's quite a simple idea. I mean, um, in the airport industry or terminal design industry, these are known as uh, holly sections. Um, I'll, I'll explain to it. Uh, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, the, 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 the one of the main ideas I reduced this basically to three main ideas for this project. One of them is that the terminal is very different than a building which you sort of stay in or uh, a building that you go to for a uh, to sort of remain within it or, or something like that. It's, it's really more of uh, infrastructure uh, rather than a building. It's, it's a place that you go through it's, it's, or it's a sort of a thing that you go through. It's in, in a certain way, you can it's compare it to, let's say, 
to a road rather than to a building. It's not a place where you go to stay and do something. So in that sense, it's sort of, it's very different than a museum or, or a library, let's say, or, or those kinds of public buildings. At the same time, a terminal building, uh, you cannot lock it up. You know, a museum or a library or whatever the institution is, at certain time during the day or during night, they lock it up. It's over, you know, you, you leave and it, it closes. The terminal is not like that. Uh, it doesn't have sort of like a single door that you can lock up. It's, it's, it's 24 hour space. And it's a space to accommodate movement, basically to connect land side to air side and vice versa. And it's very clear, it has two sides. Again, you know, land side and air side. This is more or less a typical section of this terminal that we've been designing. This, this is the, the land side, and that's the air side. That's where you have jetways or air bridges that connect to the door of the plane. And this is where you have the, the road, the curbsides, departure, arrival curbsides, that in this case go through sort of the first part of the building. They become part of the building. It's become a fairly simple, it has to be in order to get it built in time, uh, but also maybe because I cannot think of very complicated things and you know, I just like to just have these sort of simple lines. Uh, that's, that's the 18,000 uh, cubic meter of concrete that I was telling you about. Altogether, it's, it's a, it seems to be a, a very simple form, but uh, it's, it's actually not. And it's, it's a very fluid form. And every time you sort of touch it, every time you want to, what I mean by touching, every time you have it on the computer and you want to take a section or a plan or something, it, it changes. And it's, it's, it's a very, it's, it's sort of, I don't know, it's, it's very fluid. And we've gone through a lot of variations of this form. And it's always changing. Uh, I think it just has to come to one day, which will be very soon, in a matter of, I don't know, 10 or two weeks, uh, 10 days or two weeks, where uh, they're going to start pouring the first parts of the foundation. You know, it's an old country, it's an amazing site, you know all this. <laughs> uh, it's vast, you know, these are no little islands, very big, huge. Um, and ev wherever you dig, or wherever they dig, at least they find, I mean, the, the last thing uh, was they found something which uh, was a kind of some rooms and porcelain and black porcelain, black stuff, porcelain, that kind of stuff, which was, uh, which dated back to 7,000 years. And that's n not uh, unusual in Iran. Everywhere you dig, uh, you find those things. No reason to stop the airport, they tell us. They, so it doesn't matter, you know, whatever we dig, you're gonna find something. You dig under that, you find something else. <laughs> that's sort of the, basic form. I, I, this version I never saw before. I don't know. Uh, it, it always, like I said, it always changes. Is one of the 
most difficult thing that we, we need to do is that uh, for the surfaces of where you have passenger movement, whether it's arrival or departure, uh, they have to be flat according to YOTA regulations. There are a lot of regulations. Uh, like I say, it's a very limited form or a very limited program. And then we have this form which uh, it has, as you can see, it has sort of difficulty uh, to deal with sort of these flat surfaces. It's a, it's a very simple idea. Uh, there are two, two boxes. And I've, I've now presented this project quite a few times to a lot of different people. And every time I present it, I have to present it according to my audience. And I have now completely sort of lost how I used to think about it. Uh, because now when I present it, I have to say, okay, this is going up in order to symbolize flight. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, those of you who know me, you know that I don't symbolize stuff. I mean, that's, you know. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not quite sure what version to give you, so. You know. But it's, it's sort of a simple idea, really, because there is there's one box, this box here, which starts from the curb side, from the road, the land side, and goes to the plane. And this box, it doesn't symbolize anything. It just indicates the space and the movement of the passengers. And it changes through the longitudinal section. This is the transverse section. It changes through the longitudinal section <coughs> according to whether this movement is for arrival or whether this movement is for departure. <coughs> and then the other box, like that, this one, the one that to some people I say symbolizes flight, that's to, for the movement of the, let's say the red wave, you know, the, the, the movement for the public. And the, one of the ideas of this terminal is that uh, we would like to in terms of public spaces and in terms of the movement of the public through the terminal, we would like to see that the public can go through the whole terminal, even if they're not passengers, uh, that they can go through the whole terminal without, of course, going through this kind of security zones because that's, that would not be possible. I mean, that would not be possible according to IATA and according to the Minister of uh, Transportation in Iran and all those things. Uh, I don't see any harm in that. But anyway, so the two uh, sort of frames uh, come together in order to allow for that. And it, it has become possible to actually do that, to, to have these public spaces to go through all the different parts of the terminal and uh, anybody, whether they're passengers coming or going, arriving or departing, or whether they're public going with the passengers, uh, the whole terminal sort of opens uh, in front of them and they have sort of visual access as well as other type of access to the whole terminal. That's sort of the sort of the basic image of it from from the land side. It's the it's as I said, it's the first terminal, and there are going to be other ones added beside it, and then the other ones that would connect to it on the south side. This has to do with the the north runway, and maybe I can use that. Uh, Was this? Okay. Yeah. See, this is, I mean, the form is literally, you can see these waves. 
again, I mean, you know, don't quote me. I mean, I, I didn't think to start thinking about waves. Now, that's another way to explain it. Uh, so that's the part which is for arrival. This one here, this wave, that goes from land side to air side, that's for departure. And then this whole thing here is for, for the public zone. And the, the departure road goes sort of not, not inside the building, but through part of the building where the structure is uh, extended. And then there is a connection, which we haven't designed yet. This is just sort of for now. Uh, uh, this uh, is a connection from the train station, which will be here in a few years, to, to the terminal. And that's the view from the air side. You all know what this is. <laughs> and that's basically the main departure <coughs> uh, space, sort of looking towards the, the air side. And that's part of the sort of the single surface that is the 18,000 cubic meter of concrete. I mean, you know, I can't tell you about all these sort of niceties that uh, between these, uh, because you have those frames that are going opposite each other, so you get the spaces where each one would have a different light coming through it and all those things. So, I mean, I, I, I didn't think about this, but I'm very happy now that I can also say that, well, I designed a building where I considered light and all those things, and I'm sure we can think of some theories for that as well. That's it.